That way we can focus on Laura, okay? All right, I'm gonna now ask Ruth to introduce, formally introduce Laura. <laughs> Ruth? Um, hello everyone and uh, welcome, as Marianne said, to the first Friends of the Moffitt Library Zoom cultural program. Um, and uh, I wanna talk a little bit about Laura for a minute. And although this is Laura's first Zoom presentation, this is not her first appearance for the Friends of the Moffitt Library. Some of you who are um, members of our local Washingtonville Library may recall that in the not so distant past when we were all able to gather together in our Moffitt Library meeting room, Laura was the art historian we called upon to present a program on Lewis Comfort Tiffany and specifically provide us with background on the Moffitt Library's own Tiffany windows. She's a retired art educator who has taught all aspects of visual arts and art history at all levels. Those of us who have attended Laura's many classes at the Desmond Center know Laura as a knowledgeable, thorough, and engaging teacher. She's also a docent at the Storm King Art Center. We're excited to have her here today to do this first talk on renowned artist Winslow Homer. She'll be back on January 20th for a presentation focused on Edward Hopper. And on February 17th, recognition of Black History Month, she will speak about Jacob Lawrence. So please remember, mute yourself. And if you have any questions, um, you know, we'll come back at the end and Laura will be able to respond to those. So maybe you want to write them down while we're going along um, and she's doing her presentation. Um, okay, ready to go, Laura. Okie doke. So you can all see the images, correct? Correct. Good. Okay, that's good, though, because I know you can't hear me now. All right. Well, it's a, it's a great honor and pleasure to be able to uh, share with you some information about Winslow Homer. Um, Winslow Homer uh, was born in 1836. He passed away in 1910. Uh, and um, he was very, very prolific, not only as a painter, but he started, as you'll see, he started as an illustrator. So I'm starting with this particular scenario. And it's a scene that you all might know very well. And it's actually Route 32, you're looking at Route 32, going south from the uh, Moon to Creek Bridge. Um, and Stunamunk Mountain is in the back and these great open fields are, are there, snow covered. This is from a few years ago. Well, if you've been down that road uh, and um, uh, you know there was a, a big for sale sign there for a long time. And as you're going south on the road, on your left, you'll see a little street that's called Winslow's Way. And oh. Winslow's Way, there's a house there that's called the Lodge. And the Lodge plays a very important part in um, Winslow Homer's um, life because he spent a couple of summers here, 1878 and 1879, but I'll get into that in a few seconds. Well, this, is, this was the site of Houghton Farm. And Houghton Farm was a tremendous um, uh, agricultural uh, an experimental farm up to about a thousand acres uh, that was purchased by a man called Lawson Valentine. Lawson Valentine was, uh, he owned, he owned many things, uh, he owned many things, but his primary, um, his primary uh, uh, interest was in a varnish company that produced varnish for, uh, you know, for, for securing boats. And so he was able to have a, a great fortune. And in the, in the fortune, he also wanted to acquire, as many people did, he wanted to acquire a gentleman's farm. Now, the key to all of this is that he, his chief chemist in, uh, in the city where his Valspar varnish company was, was a man called Charles Homer. And Charles Homer was the chief chemist, but his brother was Winslow Homer. And so that's how Winslow Homer eventually made it to uh, made it up to Mountainville uh, in the in the 1870s. And so when he came to Mountainville and he spent several summers there, his primary focus was using the media of watercolor. And he was able to produce 50 completed watercolor paintings, most of which uh, the Valentine family bought. Um, and they had been uh, bequeathed to the, the members of the family, and they're now in various institutions. But in the, in the terms of, of uh, Winslow Homer as an artist himself, this is where he really began to explore the medium of watercolor paint 
loosening up his technique and really produce some lovely, lovely, uh, lovely paintings, which we really see. Uh, we'll, we'll see a little further on into the presentation. So Winslow Homer, Winslow Homer himself was um, was from Boston stock, but he wasn't from Boston aristocratic stock. He came from a long line of, of tradespeople and shopkeepers, and his his uh, his earliest art training was from his mother. His mother, as as mo many Victorian women did, did watercolor paintings of flowers, and so that was his earliest training. Um, and he he. Uh, didn't have the occasion, and uh, wasn't the world's best student either, but he didn't have the occasion to go on to art training. And what they did in those days is they apprenticed out. And as a youth, he apprenticed to a Boston lithographer, uh, printmaker, who taught him uh, the basics of setting up uh, 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 illustrative or illustrative scenes. And he also taught him the process of lithography, of steel cutting, and primarily of drawing. And so it was in, in these early drawings in the, in the 1850s, in these early drawings, he uh, began to learn the, the mechanics, mechanics of illustrating stories through the visual image so that when people would look at the image um, and read the story or a headline, they'd be able to tell the, you know, tell the action of the story itself. So he learned, he learned a lot of these illustrative storytelling, visual storytelling techniques um, through copying artists, through copying paintings. And at that particular time in the 1850s, he was able, and he was in at the forefront of copying photographs of, of uh, particular portraits and uh, things like that. So he basically, he refined his drawing skills, and these are early drawings in his life. He's probably about 20 years old here. And he, he, um, he worked with this, uh, you know, with this lithographer for a couple of years. And then he said, I've had enough, I need to move on. And he moved on to the offices of Harper's Weekly, where he was a freelance uh, lithographer, a freelance illustrator in the, in the mid to late 1870s, 1850s. And so by, by uh, 1850s, he was doing these images of daily life. And in the top, in the top two on the left, it's the holiday of Thanksgiving and it's the family life of Thanksgiving. On the right, it's Christmas, cutting down the tree. All of these, um, these images that would be appealing to families and telling stories about uh, you know, everyday life. And in the bottom left there, this is in about 1858, you see the, like a, a, a dance, a military cadet dance at, uh, at West Point, which varies quite a bit from the other images in that it shows a lot of movement. In these early assignments, of which there were many, he, he really basically honed his illust illustrating skills, but he also uh, really was more interested in the aspect of, of composition. Um, and as a lithographer, he did not, he produced the drawings. He did not do the images for Harper's Weekly. They, they sent them out to steel cutters in order to create or recreate the image themselves. But what he also learned, and if you look in each of the images, is that all of the action is in the front or the foreground of the composition. So that, uh, you know, the storytelling takes place in the front. And as you move or you recede to the background, the images get lighter but they're, they're part of the composition, but they get lighter in, in, uh, in view. So at this time, he had lived in New York City and he, his studio, he had a tiny little studio in lower Manhattan, but his studio was fairly close to another artist that you might know from Civil War history. And his name, and it was a photographer, is Matthew Brady. And Matthew Brady, Brady. Also, yep, you know Matthew Brady. Well, Matthew Brady, also did a lot of, uh, well, his main, his main uh, um, concentration as a photographer was portrait photographer, or portrait photography. And so since uh, Winslow Homer was employed by Harper's Weekly, um, and they were also, this is also pre-election uh, pre, uh, of, of the president in, in 1860, uh, the Harper's Weekly as a, a, a publication were very uh, in, in favor of Abraham Lincoln as every, an everyday candidate. And so they had, in February 1860, they had commissioned Matthew Brady to take a portrait 
photograph of Abraham Lincoln, which is in the lower left, at when he was speaking at Cooper Union in New York City. At, just before the election itself, Harper's Weekly commissioned uh, Winslow Homer to do a, uh, a drawing uh, so that it become, could become the cover of Harper's Weekly um, and also promote voting for Abraham Lincoln itself. And you could see basically, except for the reversal of the image, and that happens when uh, you do a print, you could see how Winslow Homer changed the, the photograph uh, into his own image. And the biggest, the biggest changes, and I'll point them out to you, is that um, in the photograph and, and below, uh, Abraham Lincoln is standing there very stoically, very much a, a, a very stern, um, uh, you know, stern appearance. He has big ears, he's leaning on something, and he has nothing for a background. What Winslow Homer did is he put him very much in a, a, a European type of background with the withdrawn curtain, so almost as if he was standing on a balcony. Um, he has his hand on a book, which indicates knowledge. On the table, there is an inkwell, which indicates that he is uh, an orator or he is, uh, uh, you know, he's a great writer. And he doesn't have that stern, uh, you know, that very withdrawn look that, uh, that is actually, that was actually in his appearance. And the other thing that he did, if you look in the photograph, is that Lincoln had very large ears. And what uh, Winslow Homer did is he covered the ears a lot with the, uh, <laughs> right, with, with the hair. So he made him a very accessible image for people that would be reading this across the United States. From this, from this, uh, you know, this very successful cover for Harper's Weekly, then um, uh, Homer was then commissioned to go to Washington DC for the inauguration or the first inauguration of Abraham Lincoln. And that, uh, that inauguration uh, took place in March of 1861, which was actually five months uh, before uh, the beginning of the Civil War. And the inauguration itself, it, it, the actual image is below, the photographic image is below, that was taken by um, uh, a, uh, a photographer that worked with Matthew Brady. And that served as the impetus for the illustration that, uh, that Homer did itself. And, and mainly, uh, you know, what, what Homer did, and if you can compare the two, he moved the flag to the left, so it's very, very prominent in the scene. And he also created a podium where you could see, very small, but you could see uh, Lincoln taking the oath of office, whereas in the photograph, he, you know, he's so far away. But Homer also did, in the foreground, and this is pretty much uh, what he did, uh, you know, with many of his illustrations, that in the foreground of the image itself, he gave personalities, meaning that he, he showed them in their dress and their top hats, and he gave, he gave places, he gave people, uh, you know, actual imagery to show that. Well, five months later, five months later, the, uh, you know, the, the conflict was, uh, was heating up uh, with the Civil War, and, uh, and again, uh, the Harper's Weekly had a, a group of uh, artists that they were sending out to document the war itself and send back, back their drawings. Well, they liked Homer, particularly because he was uh, tw young, 25 years old, he could travel, he was active, um, and he was very, uh, you know, he was very uh, important to the magazine itself because with the Civil War came the, uh, you know, the, the uh, surge in their, uh, you know, their, their uh, population of, of magazines that they're, they're uh, you know, they, they went from several thousand to several hundred thousand and, uh, you know, within the United States. But where he, Winslow Homer, you know, when he's, he joined artists and photographers on the front, sending back campaign sketches, but where he differed from many of the other uh, uh, artists that were sending back imagery is that he didn't, at least in the very beginning, he never showed any of the actual hand-to-hand -hand combat. And so he was very much interested in the daily, uh, the daily goings on, um, you know, of, of uh, you know, the, the service people. And, and the life on the front itself. So what you're looking at uh, right now, besides, you know, uh, on the left, you're looking at um, 
the generals of the north and then the the succeeding um, uh, 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 the succeeding delegation from Congress from the southern states. Those were those were uh, front pages. But on the top right hand corner, you're looking at what's what's known as the 79th Highland Voluntary Infantry, and the the infantry itself. And you notice they're all in Scottish Scottish tartans. Many of them were not actually Scottish, but they they started as a social club in New York City in 1858, um, and they they became, uh, you know, it's a very high class uh, group of gentlemen. It was a gentleman's club, very wealthy uh, backers there. Um, they had no connections themselves actually to the Highlanders in Scotland, only in name and tartan. And here you see them going down in a parade on Fifth Avenue um, in, uh, in um, it's, it's 1861 uh, when they were mobilized. And they were mobilized to go to fight in the Battle of First Bull Run in July 60, uh, 1861. They were in fierce fighting. Uh, it was very serious battles there. And they had the highest amount of casualties. Um, and, and after that particular battle, they went back to Washington, D.C., where they started to build, build fortresses. So from this very glorious, auspicious beginning, they, uh, you know, they, they suffered a great deal. In the bottom image, you see part of an, uh, a double page spread illustration of the songs that were becoming popularized in 1861. Glory, hallelujah, Dixie, you know, the, the grand old days there. And again, you see these images of uh, um, daily life. Where he excelled, however, um, was in these life in the camp scenarios. And create two separate series of these lives in the camp um, that were printed on cards. They were also printed in the, in, the Harper's, in the Harper's Weekly, but these were very, very popular and printed in cards. On, and on the top left-hand uh, image, you can see Winslow Homer himself that he drew himself in. Again, this is part of a, a two-page spread, but he drew himself in as our special correspondent or our special artist. And what the funny part about this is, he's wearing He's wearing this long hair, a beard, a schlunky hat, and loose-fitting clothing, which he didn't actually wear in reality, um, but he had been on the front for several months, um, but he wanted to be able to show the, uh, you know, he, that he wasn't styled as an urban gentleman on the front there himself. Um, so what he's sitting on, uh, he's sitting on a barrel, but in other images, he had him sitting on a, a cannon there. Uh, himself. So, so what you're looking at is just really basically a handful of, of the hundreds of illustrations that he did with, uh, you know, with the, um, you know, with his, his tenure down at, in, in Virginia, Petersburg, Richmond, and down in, particularly in Virginia there. Um, and he, uh, he didn't, he didn't show the, what they called the military histrionics, the battlefronts, all of that. And, but he, you know, he recorded many of the, the goings on in the background. Uh, and he used it as an ex exercises of, of pictorial representations and very sweet pictorial representations. So within a year, however, the, the battles started getting worse and he still, uh, you know, he still kept to his, his mantra of portraying the life in the camp and the life of the soldier. And the reality of it was, and, and this is where you really started to see, the reality was that the, the, uh, the casualties were getting worse, um, but he, he always acknowledged the women, the nurses, um, the people that came to the aid of the, uh, of the soldiers themselves and the life themselves, uh, themselves as well. Um, so, this is about 1860, 1862, and you know life can you know life continued on for him, and this very much this this genre, uh, for another year, um, until 1862, and in 18, 1862, 1863, he <clears throat> he was introduced to a rogue, what they call a rogue painter, a painter that was in with the troops. Um, Winslow Homer was not a painter; he really. Uh, you know, very, very, uh, did not have a, a, an extensive painting background because the only painting he really learned was from his mother. But he was very willing to start to try to create a painting. And so he took 
this, uh, this particular image, which is a total break from any of the images uh, that he, he had done previous to that. And this image itself, it's the painting we're looking at first. The painting is, uh, the image is called the sharpshooter. And the sharpshooter, um, the interesting aspect of this is from the point of view of the viewer. And the viewer is standing on the ground looking at the sharpshooter. And the, he was, the sharpshooter itself was part of a league of, of very um, important uh, militia that were almost like sniper shots. And uh, they, they had to get in, in these, you know, these, these positions in order to shoot their targets. And so the, uh, the, the, the important aspect of this is the focus of the, uh, the sharpshooter himself. You notice in the painting that there is no face. Um, it's, it's uh, you know, an anonymous soldier. You will notice also, and this was also the other aspect of this, it's modern weaponry for, 18, and for the 1860s. Um, you know, the, 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 the rifle, the, the automatic rifle there. And uh, he's, the, he's focused through that, uh, that lens, um, looking down at the barrel. Um, and so he's, he's, he's really uh, having that, having the viewer, us, look to see what, it's almost as if it's a photograph in itself, but look to see what the, what the sharpshooter is doing. 40 years later, Winslow Homer made a comment with regards to this painting, which he then later turned into a, an illustration, which is slightly different because if you look in the tree, you could see um, his, uh, you know, the, what do you call that for the water? Um, whatever, anyway, so you could see the, the uh, you can see a, f a few various differences, and you can also see a little bit of a personality. But 40 years later, he said, he looked through one of the soldier's rifles, and what I saw, what I saw was the, it was, it was the closest to murder that I'd ever want to be, because he could see a peach in the next orchard. And that's how, you know, that's how, uh, uh, you know, he, how he was taken so much with these, with these, um, with these, these soldiers and the and the activity that they did there as well. Well, he continued. He continued on um, as a as the special correspondent for Harper's Weekly um, throughout the war. Very rarely producing a painting because his paintings had to be worked from the sketches that he done uh, did on the field, and and then were able to work was able to work on when he got back to his studio. And one of his most important paintings that he did when he got back to the studio at the end of the war was a painting called Prisoners from the Front. And, it, and considering it's after the war, it's very much, uh, and again, worked from sketches and worked from models that he set up or dummies that he set up in his studio. But it's very much a statement of the, uh, the, the attitude of the, uh, the Northern artists, of which he was one, the Nord Northern artists and their public. And what you're looking at is uh, Brig Brigadier General Francis Barlow on the extreme right. Um, he is, uh, he along with his men, captured a, a, a contingent of Southern soldiers. But if you look at this very carefully, I'm going to point out some things to you. So. Brigadier General Barlow is on the extreme right in the dark blue uniform. And you see the, um, the, the captain of the captured Southern troop. If you look at their poses, and you, uh, you know, if you look at their poses, they are replicated of each other. And what that indicates to the viewer is that he, uh, Homer, um, equalized the positions that each of these men served within their troops. So, you know, the, the poses mimic each other. The three Confederate <coughs> soldiers, the, you know, the three soldiers on the left, they basically show the three ages of man. Um, starting from the very, the very far left, you see a fairly young soldier, and, and you can tell especially, you know, by the pose and the, and the expression on his face. In the middle, you see an older soldier that has probably been, uh, you know, was a farmer in the fields or something, and he was put into action, probably at no will for his own. And then you see the commanding soldier of the South there, and you see them in their battlements and their grace, as opposed to the Northern soldiers in the navy blue there, 
Um, and in particular, uh, the soldier in the middle with, with the rifle. That serves as a, uh, uh, you know, as, as a background or a backdrop of the, uh, of the, uh, of the, the Northern troops themselves. Behind Gen Brigadier General Barlow, behind him, you see in the, the, you know, in the shaded out, you see horses and you see Northern soldiers and Southern soldiers because the Northern soldiers and the Southern soldiers are, are you know, they're, they're the captives there. But this is a trick that he, you know, brought over into his painting from the, uh, from his days in, uh, in illustration for the Harper's Weekly where the, the image or the action takes place in the foreground. Now, also very interesting itself, if you look on the ground, you see that the, the, the rifles are on the ground. War is over, the battle is over, the, the armaments are on the ground. You also see in the background to the left and behind General Barlow, burnt out trees. Um, that's the, the scene of the battlefield. Um, it is also, as some people refer to, some historians refer to it as the loss of the loss of Eden. You know, the burned out, of, uh, the burning out of Eden there. Um, so uh, this painting is very important for, for many reasons, um, but particularly because it shows the humanity that the the northern soldiers showed with the the the, the southern shoulder, the southern soldiers as well. Um, and also the theme there is the victor and the vanquished. The victor is the north, the vanquished, or the, you know, the, the, the losers are the south there. This image, when it was uh, shown in the National Academy of Design in New York, created quite a stir, meaning that um, it, was a, uh, it was very well received. And this painting itself brought or, or achieved for Winslow Homer uh, his his fame. It started to to uh, as a painter. It started to achieve for him uh, uh, an acknowledgement that he was a skilled painter that could show uh, images that weren't romanticized in views. Um, after the war, he he also did another. Well, he did quite a few, uh, but he also went back down to the south uh, <clears throat> and. Again, chronicled first through drawings and then translated into paintings. But in this particular image, this is called the veteran in the new field. Here you have a whole crop of soldiers that are coming home to what? Um, they're coming home either to their old professions or, you know, or to moving on to the cities. But what this has been interpreted as in, in several different uh, di several different ways. You see a soldier. No, no indication of the person who has tossed aside his military guard, and he is scything, he is scything um, uh, the, the, the field of wheat. Well, why wheat? Well, wheat is important for the continuation of, uh, you know, man's existence for, with bread. Uh, the interpretation thinks, uh, you know, some interpretive symbols there is that uh, this was a, a, a symbol of the restoration of both the North and the South after the war and achieving or getting back into a sense of normalcy or a sense of life after the war. Or um, it is the, 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 the farmer himself is citing he is death um, and he's cutting down the, 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 the wheat very much as the war cut down the lives of hundreds of thousands of young uh, soldiers uh, during the war itself. Or if you look at this without any symbolic reference to the war itself, it's a lovely landscape with blues and golden light with uh, you know, a farmer doing his job in, in, this, in the season itself. In, in uh, several of the instances when he went back to the South, he visited some of the old plantations um, and, and wanted to revisit uh, some of life as it existed uh, for the emancipated uh, emancipated uh, slaves, and uh, he wanted to record that. And particularly, he made several paintings, of which this is probably the most important. And it's called A Visit from the Old Mistress, um, which the original title was, or one of the titles was, was called Mistress in the Old Slave Quarters. And what you're seeing here in this painting was done in about 1866, 1867, is something that is very telling of life post the Civil War. Even though the slaves had been emancipated, how are they existing? They're wearing the same clothes that they had worn during their, their slavery. Um, they are 
<clears throat> still in the same slave quarters, but what's different? What's different is the separation between they, the, the emancipated slaves and the mistress, the mistress in her refinery um, and the very straightforward type of pose there um, is looking at eye to eye with, with uh, one of her emancipated slaves. Um, you also see two other important things. On the very left hand, on the very left hand portion of the painting, you see one of the women is sitting down. In the days of slavery, that would never have happened. That as soon as the mistress walked into the room, everybody had to stand up and stand at attention. And you're also seeing a child. And the child is there for a very important reason. And the reason is because the child represents the future. Um, so it's a, it's, a, it's a painting that, again, was created from, uh, you know, from many sketches, but it also more or less displays that the tension that still existed in the years immediately following the war, uh, the Civil War, particularly in the South. Well, after, after uh, a period of a couple of years, 1866, 1867, um, <clears throat> Homer had, Winslow Homer had decided he wanted to become a better artist. And his family, who, uh, you know, his only source of income was through Harper's Weekly. So his family had cribbed together some money, uh, you know, to fund him to go to Europe for a year. Harper's Weekly also, um, you know, encouraged him to go there and study the great painters in the in the galleries and you know see the art where the, where the art field art world was going and then how to you know when he would come back he would then translate it into more images for Harper's Weekly and also um, you know to increase his career there. So he studied in the Louvre um, and the image that you see on the top left hand corner there is very indicative of the 1870s, 1860s, 1870s in the Louvre um, because So what folks did, uh, how they studied art, um, was that they copied paintings, they copied drawings, they copied paintings, they copied technique, they copied composition. Um, but what you didn't see in the studios or the academies in Paris um, was women in the studios themselves. They were banned from studying with men in, in the artistic studios. So <clears throat> they more or less started their own school. And here Homer is, is indicating the intensity of which women were studying and allowed to study in the Louvre itself. When he, when he was there, he became very familiar with the contemporary uh, Barbizon school and the, the school of uh, realists, uh, landscape painters. Um, he also be, started to become uh, familiar with several of the contemporary um, uh, impressionist painters that were really just coming to the forefront in the late 1860s and 1870s. And, um, and so that started to change his point of view and perspective uh, as far as how he was going <clears throat> how he was changing his artistic style as well. So when he came back to the United States and back to New York and back to his tiny little studio down in, in lower Manhattan, he then <clears throat> was able to you know, accumulate these drawings and then go out into the field, out, out, outside, and then observe um, life as it existed in the uh, you know, post-Civil War era. So what you're looking at in the upper right is Long Branch, New Jersey. And uh, Long Branch, New Jersey, you see the proclivity or you see that most of the people that you see within this image are what? They are women. And they are women who are not bathing, but they're women that are taking a, a walk. Um, women of a specific social class, um, you know, very lovely women. On the lower, on the lower image, you see women who are out um, at a very popular Northern Catskill tourist destination from, I would say, the 1830s uh, and still very popular today. And that place is called the Catterskill Falls, which was the tallest falls in, this, in, in Eastern New York. And here you have these two women that are uh, you know, walking unescorted, but walking and climbing the rocks so that they could walk behind the falls themselves. So this, the, these images are, uh, you know, a break in, uh, you know, the formality of the images that he was producing during the war, but moving into, <clears throat> moving into a little bit different uh, scenario or realism that he hadn't, uh, you know, he, he had experienced while he was in France. Um, and then he, he wanted to parallel them with life in the United States. So um, <clears throat> one of the series he did 
when he came back was a series of five paintings of which these are three. And they're, they're based on the game of croquet. And if you look at the three images, you can see that there's, you know, there's similarities, but yet there's differences. And I chose to put the largest image, uh, the largest image, I chose to put that there uh, for, for a reason, okay? So if you take a look at the lower right-hand corner, <clears throat> you see it's the same exact image, correct? You see that? And the women are playing, they're competing in a game called croquet, which uh, had just recently uh, come to the United States from the United Kingdom and became a very uh, you know, popular game, outside game sport that could be played on a flat ground that could be pay played by women of a particular social st strata or social class. And so you see that, you see that um, particularly in the way that uh, Homer has, has shown them with their mode of dress. These are direct influences or reflections of his, his, uh, um, his recent viewings of French painting, uh, particularly Impressionist painting of women outside. Um, but also in his, is his terminology, his visual terminology, there are images of women that are um, expressing their independence in particular, in particularly as uh, there is a gentleman in the center image, no, no uh, indication of who he is, but he's crouching down, setting up the ball for the women uh, to to play uh, to play their uh, to play their games. So basically, it's about the, you know the leisure class and and the the new things that were coming to America. Well, Winslow Homer wasn't noted for his uh, courtships. Um, <clears throat> he had, he knew several women, um, but he became very, uh, very friendly with a woman that was introduced to him. Um, her name was Helena Decay, and um, he, uh, he, he used her as model in several uh, images um, that were very, very romantic. And these images are believed to have been created in around the Hudson Valley, um, particularly because Helena Decay had a very good friend that lived near Milton and also was, uh, you know, it was, um, uh, you know, they would spend their summers up and through that area. And so he would also visit. Uh, but uh, he, he had also tutored Helena in, in um, uh, some drawing and some painting, but he was very much in love with her. Well, to make the long and short story of it is that, um, uh, you know, he, he, he sought out her friendship, but it wasn't reciprocal. After a while, it was not reciprocal. And she landed up marrying a poet named Richard Watson Gilder. Um, and so, in, you know, and, and she went off in that very ways. And it was from a, a particularly from this, uh, this rejection that he more or less moved away from these romanticized images of, of uh, women there uh, himself. During also that time in, in the 1870s, he spent some time in and around the Hurley area and Milton and, and Walden and, um, and the countryside there. So I'm gonna show you a couple of images, but I'm, sh I'm showing them there for a reason um, because <clears throat> they form the background for a, a, a painting that is iconographic to America. Um, and so the, the the image here on the top left hand, uh, the top left hand corner is the little red schoolhouse and it's, it's a country school um, post post Civil War, these country schools and the, these farmer children. Um, many of these, uh, you know, farms, they were very, very isolated. Um, many of the farmers themselves, the agrarian communities, many of the farmers, they, they needed to go to the nearby local larger towns in this particular case, Kingston. Um, and, and Saugerties to find work. And so you had this, this great uh, indication of the country school. The, it also was a change in the 1860s, post-Civil post War, there was a change in the educational system where education was made more uh, 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 accessible to, to the country children themselves. And so this little red schoolhouse almost, uh, you know, it, it apparently existed and, but it almost was a romantic ideal to these, these lost country ways. And again, you see the school, the top left, you see the schoolhouse, the bottom left, you see the interior of the schoolhouse, the one room schoolhouse, where the teacher stands in front of a blackboard, reading or reciting where the children are situated around 
um, or, you know, around the teacher and doing their studies. And on the top right hand corner, you see the teacher herself, who is, um, you know, is just walking away from the, uh, you know, from the school, probably after school. But in these particular images, they're, they're very iconographic of a lifestyle. And so to these images, then he painted this, this series, he painted three images. Um, the top one is, uh, um, is in the Metropolitan Museum. The bottom one is in the Butler Institute in Ohio. The names of the paintings are called Snap the Whip. Um, Snap the Whip uh, is a game that is another game that was played by children um, in the fields during recess. Uh, and, um, and, and the, the value of this painting itself is it, it's indicative because of the importance of children and how children in this case embody the idea of innocence, particularly after the Civil War, after the war. And it was a theme that uh, united both writers and artists in the United States during the late 1860s and well into the 1870s. Why? Because 1876, the United States um, was approaching its first centennial, its 100th anniversary. And so um, it was, uh, you know, it was something that was very important culturally to, to the United, the people, the American, the American people itself. So what do you see? You see, you see children, boys, that are playing this rough and rugged game, and they're in their in their in their you know their their normal clothes. The hems are rolled up, but they're barefoot, and the barefoot, the barefoot, their you know their feet, bare feet indicate a sense of freedom that they're not tied down by enclosed shoes. You also see suspenders on several of the young boys, and the suspenders. If you look towards it in a, in a symbolic way, the suspenders are indicative of adult responsibilities, um, and, you know, and, and achieving and going to adulthood. And the game itself, the game itself is all, uh, you know, predicated on the idea of teamwork, of and uh, symbolically, this painting. Um, more or less symbolized in the 1870s was one of, a, you know, like a symbol of a reunited nation. Um, so it was, it was, it was a lovely image, but it has much more, much more meanings than, you know, than it's, it's really focus there. So I, I suppose you notice the difference between the top and the bottom image. Yes, you see that. Um, one of the, they don't know the exact location and I was able to find two of the locations. One is in and around the area of Hurley, New York, and the other one was Southampton um, in Long Island. But I'm more or less um, um, inclined to think that it was Hurley or it was a combination of images. In, the, in, in both of the images, on the left, on the bottom, you can see a church steeple, and on the right, you can see some, um, some other buildings. So you know that it's near some type of a village there. Um, and this painting also served as the basis for many prints, uh, popular prints that was, you know, very popular with, uh, uh, you know, the local uh, people itself. So that brings us to Houghton Farm again. And it brings us to the summer of, of 18, uh, uh, 1878. So as I mentioned in the beginning, Houghton Farm was owned by Lawson Valentine. He, over the course of the, uh, of the years that he owned it, and he passed the farm down to his, um, his children and his grandchildren. Um, he, he accumulated about a thousand acres. Um, and when uh, uh, Winslow Homer was invited up to the farm by Mr. Valentine, who was one of his patrons, he had free access to the countryside. And so, you know, you like to think about the fact that he was tramping literally all over uh, the area on either sides of, of uh, Route 32. And um, most of Houghton Farm, a lot of that part of Houghton Farm, which extended up to the Scunamonk Ridge, um, in, during the 1950s when, you know, they, they were building the uh, New York Thruway, um, kind of like destroyed a lot of, a, a lot of the, the farmland itself. But during the heyday of its era, they, uh, Mr. Valentine raised all types of, of uh, cows and horses and sheep um, in, in his range there. His house itself was a series of houses and barns that were built on top of the hill. 
uh, he constructed a winding road up to the top of the hill. So where from the top, you know, from the, from the auspices of the house itself, from the porches on clear days, they could see out to the Newburgh Bay. They could see off to the, to the um, uh, you know, off to the west, they could see the Catskill Mountains. So it was a very, very beautiful location. And the best part was that the Mountainville train station was about a mile and a half away from the farm itself. So it was easy access for uh, both the Lawson family and any of their guests. I put this, put this one, uh, put this image in here because it has, and I, I mentioned in the beginning, uh, the idea of sense of place. Um, uh, one of the about 50 images that uh, Homer did when he was in Mountain View was this image called Fresh Air. And when I was a, a college, all those years ago, when I was a college in college, um, we had taken a trip to the Whitney and, and the Whitney Museum was having a retrospective exhibit, it was in the early 70s, was having a retrospective exhibit on Winslow Homer, the artist. And as soon as I saw this image, I was so drawn to it, first of all, because I saw me where I wanted to be, outside, not in. And second, because of the location was in Mountainville, and I was very familiar with Mountainville at the time. So I, I've always retained um, a, a fondness for this painting. But more importantly, this gives you an indication of some of the themes that he used within, uh, you know, with many of these, these images himself. The images focused, the Houghton Farm images focused not only on the landscape, but focused on, focused on the children. And um, um, even though there were sheep being raised on the, on the farms there himself, I'm in he, didn't, he, didn't, he didn't want to really um, focus in on the adults. He wanted to focus in on the children because they were the future, because they were a symbol of innocence, and because, and because they, he was able to you know, be, have a sensitivity towards them without having, you know, without having visually having to say too much. Um, so in the top one's the shepherdess, and the bottom one is the two, the two children on a little rowboat down on the stream down at the bottom there. Um, what you're looking, what I want you to look at in particular is how his watercolor imagery has now loosened up, that his lines are very simple, um, basically his guidelines, and the paint, uh, which he probably did some of that site, but uh, you know, when he came into the lodge, that first, when we looked at that little, uh, that image in the very first slide, that's where he was staying. He, he finished up a lot of these paintings. He had a tendency to paint in pairs, um, and the children were local farmers' children. When he first, apparently when he first asked some of the children to come and model for him, they came in their Sunday finery thinking that they were going to, you know, be painted, you know, as, as lovely young children. But he was disappointed because he wanted to paint them in the, in, you know, in a, in a, 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 a rural type of a scene. So he had, he had a great collection of costumes and he had some of, of uh, costumes of shepherds and shepherdesses and he allowed the children to, to wear those uh, costumes for him as he created the scenes. And this is called the styles. This is a brother and sister. Um, if you notice the mountain in the back, that's the Scunamunk Mountain behind, a, behind us there. The children are climbing over a stile. The sun, it's a bright sunny day. What he's achieving with these watercolors is the effect of light. Very, very simply with, I mean, I say it's simply, it's very difficult to do, but he's, he's refined a sense of watercolor down to its basic elements and yet tell a story without much of the fluff that goes that was going into many of the paintings themselves. Um, and again, <clears throat> you see this reaper. Now this reaper uh, is the chi it's a child doing the work of an adult in a field, you know, a hay field there, um, complete with daisies. And also in the field across the road, there was great pumpkin patches and, and, uh, <clears throat> and, and the wheat field, uh, you know, gathered up uh, at the end of the summer. And this next, uh, this next image has another little story behind it. It's two boys in a pasture. And again, he did a great series of these paintings. This painting is in oil that was translated. He did a series of these paintings. Um, it was translated from drawings and, and watercolor sketches. But many years ago, I would say about 15, 20 years ago, and you're all, you're all familiar with Jones Farm. Well, <clears throat> a little, little aside from uh, you know, the, the dialogue here, is that in Jones Farm, upstairs in Jones Farm, there's a gift shop. 
And um, the, before the gift shop was extended, where the children's area is now, a copy of this painting was up tall on the wall there, along with a, a map of Cornwall. And I had mentioned to David Clearwater, I said, do you know that that's a Winslow Homer? And of course he did. <clears throat> and he, he said, yeah, you know, we were talking about Winslow Homer and his association with Houghton Farm. Well, the story of, of the Jones Farm and his wife, uh, uh, you know, Doris Clearwater, is Doris Clearwater's relatives worked on Houghton Farm um, in, at the end of the 19th and beginning of the 20th century. And it was when, it was at that point when his, his ancestor, uh, David, Clearwater, David Clearwater's ancestor, ancestors walked over the mountain and established their own farm on the other farm of the, on the other side mm. of the hill from Houghton Farm there as well. So it's, it's, a, it's a very, when you talk about sense of place, there is a quite, quite an astute feeling, feeling to a lot of these images. Well, that was in the 1870s. Also in the 1870s, in the, just post-World War, uh, post the, uh, uh, the Civil War, there was a great movement to the outside, to the wilderness, to get away from the city, particularly if you are a person of means. And in the late 1860s, uh, a book uh, uh, called The Adirondack Guide was written, and it was distributed particularly in the, you know, New York City. And what it did was it created like a cult of, of uh, people, for men, who wanted to escape to this, this great patch of wilderness up in the Adirondacks. The railroad, by this time in the, in the uh, late 1860s, early 1870s, the railroad had, uh, had gone, extended its line into the Adirondacks. The great hotels started to be built and people would start to take their, their holidays up in that particular area. And in the very, very early days, um, in say in the 1870s, if the population during the high season reached 3,000, that was quite a lot. By the turn of the century, it was up to a quarter of a million people. And I'm right. really not sure how many people were there now, are there coming up to the area itself, but it has changed quite a deal, uh, quite a deal there. But the important aspect of, about this, it was the call to nature, particularly for sportsmen. And so you had these men who came from their clubs and spent a week or two weeks fishing and hunting. And when they, well, we'll just move on for it. When they came up to the Adirondacks, they very much relied on local guides. And the, the uh, you know, guides were, were these, these farmers and hermits that had lived in these mountains for generations. And they knew where all the good hunting was. They knew where all the good fishing was, were. And, um, they they uh, were you know hired out to take these gentle gentlemen out to uh, to bag a deer or a bear or or a fish or whatever because they knew all the best spots and Winslow Homer used this to the best of his abilities and he began series and series of paintings of the guides and also of the fishermen and the hunters and all of that but he's, he he. Homer himself was a great fisherman. He loved to fish. And he was also a very, very shrewd businessman because in the years following uh, the Civil War from the 17, 1870s till say the 18, late 1880s, he made 20 different trips up to the Adirondacks. He made quite a lot of contacts and he made quite a lot of watercolor paintings. Um, and he sold them. And he, he really was, you know, began, got, uh, gained a lot of popularity for his outdoor scenarios, um, <clears throat> for his outdoor scenarios. And he created, and this will give you an indication about how prolific he was with his paintings, because if you see that they're not tremendously, particularly the one on the left, they're not tremendously technical, that he could probably, at this point, probably can whip out a painting within a half an hour. So he was able in a short span of time to create hundreds of paintings. And he, it said in one of the myths that goes that he had a series of perhaps 100 paintings, 150 paintings that he didn't, he didn't think were going to sell. So what did he do? He wrapped them up in string and threw it into one of the Adirondack lakes because, you know, he knew that they weren't going to sell. So, wow. um, you know, so these paintings, you know, they, they, they talk about the shores, the mountains, the, 
the fishermen, the hunters, all of that. Um, and in, in 1890, there was a, a lovely little um, uh, article about uh, the Adirondacks and Winslow Homer, and, it's, and it said, particularly in the, in the top left one, the shores and mountains are splendidly dressed in red and yellow robes of autumns, and there are blue tones in the lakes, and the coloring is intense, but, but it is neither unreal nor unpictorial. And they're recognizing, the, uh, the, the critics at, at this particular point in time are recognizing that the, 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 the very strong linear aspects or painterly qualities quality. of watercolor uh, are, are being loosened up. Now, uh, an aside to these, particular, these two particular paintings, it gives you an, uh, an, um, uh, a little insight into the idea of hunting and hunting how they did it in the Adirondacks. Well, these guides would be hired to scare a, a, a deer out into the middle of the lake. And the, the deer could not swim at great length. So they would scare the deer out into the middle of the lake. The hunters would come to the side of the lake. The hunters would shoot the deer. And yeah. then the hunters would now have their, their prey. OK, hmm. in 1881, um, um, there was a great demand for different types of paintings uh, and different types of visual imagery, particularly in the Northeast. And Homer, you know, was getting a little uh, um, restless and he, w he wanted to go someplace really where there was, he, was, he wanted to do what I would call the great escape. So he, 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 um, he went to a place in Northeast England on the Tyne and Ware Rivers um, near, uh, uh, you know, it's in the very northeast corner. And the t little village it was a fishing village and it was called Color Coats. And Color Coats was on the North Sea, very, very rough and rugged community. But Color Coats for him was something, was, was the introduction to something he had never experienced before in his life. And it was the experience of a, a, a culture that was based on, um, uh, well, besides fishing and the hard hardships of shore life, but it was also based on the um, the equality between the men and the women in their uh, in their daily duties of, of of work. And so he became very entranced with uh, the women there. They're called their reference to the fisher ladies, and the fisher ladies wouldn't go fishing, but their husbands and brothers and sons would all go out. In these ships, and you could see them in the in the on the left hand side there, these ships or these these boats that weren't exactly very sturdy, and they'd go and they do they do mass fishing. They'd come in, um, the wives would take the fish, they would barrel them, they would all the community effort, they would barrel them uh, in sea brine, so these fish would last them throughout the season or throughout the winter in particular. But they were a very very hard working group. Of so he became enamored with these with these people. These, by the way, the Homer wasn't the only one who or created images of them. Um, this was a great, uh, great um, topic for uh, British photographers at that time as well. So here he now had a whole new genre to focus on, and the the, the focus of these this color coats imagery of the theme focused on uh, the women. Um, can you see me? Can you hear me? Can you, yes. Can you hear me? Okay, it said the internet connection wasn't stable. Okay, so we focused so we, in on the fisher women and, and the, uh, the, uh, the, the daily tasks of the women themselves. He all, you also noticed that the, the, uh, because the North Sea is very dark and gray, uh, his color palette changed, so there's not, no bright and happy colors. Um, but basically the images of the women were on their everyday life and existence. The images were also on the, and you see in the top left there, were also on waiting for the husbands or the, the you know, the, the men to come in with their catch. Um, and also based on the heroicism of the women themselves, very different than the croquet players, right? So here, here he was very enamored with these women because they showed the strength of women in a culture that, um, that he had not experienced to that uh, effect at all. When times got rough, um, again, it was a very much community, a community effort, but the, the boats would be out in the North Sea, there would be storms coming up, everybody would be out on the, uh, you know, out on the beach, um, looking and waiting in hopes and anticipation um, uh, for, for the boats to come in and them to come in safely. He witnessed on many occasions 
um, you know, the tremendous strength of the sea. He witnessed the, um, the, the, the ship, you know, the shipwrecks, um, of course, in that particular part of, the, of England, you have very rocky coasts and the ships often in a storm would get caught on the rocky coast. So the, the, um, the, 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 rescues, the rescues had to, you know, do all these rescues in these very horrible, uh, ex, uh, you know, conditions. Um, and so he was able to capture this in drawing first and then come back and then work with them in, into paintings themselves. These are not oil paintings, they're what's called gouache paintings, which is a watercolor paint, but it is a, is a, it's an opaque watercolor paint, so it doesn't have the transparency. And he did a, quite a series of women, um, you know, women experiencing nature as a force itself, women experiencing their strength that they can survive, um, uh, you know, and then the top is, you know, with, with, with her child, they can survive on their own. They are strong. Um, they're ambitious. Uh, and, and they, they really show that they are women that are basically larger than life. And again, this was a subject matter that was very foreign to him, but he lived there for well over a year, almost to two years. And he took back all of these lessons from, you know, as far as developing subject matter, he took them back to the United States so that when he did come back to the United States in 1882-83, uh, um, he created, a, again, another series of paintings um, after going down to Atlantic City. And this, this is called uh, The Undertow. And The Undertow is basically, and, and the, the story behind this is that when he was in Atlantic City, he witnessed a couple of uh, very serious um, activities that uh, involved uh, people getting caught out in, in, in the waters, both on, in, in, you know, in boats or swimming. And so here you have these two lifeguards that are trying to rescue uh, these two women. Um, and uh, you know, again, it shows, it shows the idea of struggle and uh, you know, very much strength. But the interesting aspect of this painting is that he painted this, he, he set up the image, he set up the models for this painting on the roof of his studio in Manhattan. And um, he would throw buckets of water on the, on the uh, models. So he would be able to capture the glistening of the water and capture the life size, you know, the, the life uh, aspects of the, of the characters themselves. And then he positioned and he put the background in, the water in the background, the strength and, and the, the perilness of the sea. He also, he also witnessed a, uh, um, a rescue on uh, uh, what's called the breeches buoy. And the breeches buoy was a, a, a new invention that allowed a rescue to take place. Uh, it was like a, a, a pulley system that was set up from the boat, which you can hardly see on the left-hand side and on the land. And someone would go out on this pulley system, you know, a rescue uh, who, whoever needed to be rescued. And then he would be hauled back in. Um, you know, pull back into shore. Um, so the interesting aspect of this, uh, because it was, of course, during the Victorian times, is here you have a woman in a swoon who's totally unconscious, and her red scarf is covering the gentleman's face. So that, is, you know, it's like an indication of Victorian sensibility there. But again, these, these, these uh, paintings, uh, these series of paintings, show a couple of things. It shows the strength of the sea, how he translated all of the lessons he learned from the, the, the struggles of the sea in the Northeast of England. And he, he, he started to go into a whole different genre in the United States. And that was basically dealing with this power of the sea and how it affected uh, uh, you know, the people it involved in. In the, late eight, in the mid to late 1880s, um, Homer and his, uh, Winslow Homer and his brother Charles uh, went up to Prout's Neck in Maine. And um, he eventually purchased uh, a studio there, a house there. And the studio, if you can see in the lower left-hand image there, um, had windows that faced out to the sea. And the, on the right-hand corner, it was his view. And so he would go, he would live there. He, you know, he basically moved out of New York City and he would live there for most of the year. Um, and he would, his, his focus again was the sea, was the power of the sea and, and the light itself. And, um, you know, the Proud's Neck be became his home. He was able to 
or have a renewed intensity towards his subject matter. Um, he also created, again, some image, one, one of Winslow Homer's older brothers, Arthur, was, uh, was, had been in the Navy. And so he created several images that were in, in a reconnaissance or, or recognition of his brother in the Navy itself. He also painted, again, this is a fog warning, he painted the fishermen. And uh, only this is in the United States. And the fishermen in the perils, in the perils, perilous water. Um, and again, caught in a storm, um, it looks like there's no hope. And you can tell that because you hear the waves are going, uh, you know, like all these horrible swells. There is a boat in the back, a ship in the background that really isn't going to be able to rescue him. But it's that power of the sea and the strength of the sea that was very important to him. Another of the iconic images that Homer did, and you might recognize, but I want to preface that, was, uh, was that, you know, during these years, uh, again, there was uh, uh, many uh, folks from the north had gone south in, uh, you know, during the winter time, and so uh, Winslow Homer had gone to Miami, but more often than not, he went to the Caribbean, and he did a whole series of paintings that were focused on life in the in the Caribbean, on 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 the everyday life of the natives, particularly of the not the tourists, the natives of the Caribbean. There, lovely scenes of of. Uh, uh, you know the, the the life on land. However, this one is, and he did it. Uh, he did this painting in 1899. Uh, it's called the Gulf Stream, and the Gulf Stream in the Caribbean. It became a very very iconic painting. So much so that when I was in PS 91 in the Bronx up until sixth grade, this painting sc scared the bejeebers out of me because this painting <laughs> was an image on the wall in the auditorium next to an image <laughs> of George Washington and Abraham Lincoln. Couldn't understand it then. So I had lots of conflicting, you know, visual visualizations of the story of this painting there. So what you're seeing, what can you see here? You see that there's a ship that the mast has been broken, broken off. You see a native Negro on the boat. The boat is, is being tossed around on the, on the, on the waves. Um, and in the water where the waves are like going crazy, you see sharks. And you see sharks, because if you look in the water, you see red. You see the red? So they were drawn to the blood, all right? And the sharks are surrounding surrounding the ship. And so you, you have a very dire uh, appearance of, you know, story, this image of what's going to happen. Initially, until I was maybe, I would say, maybe 10 years ago, the green things on the boat I thought were snakes. And uh -huh. as it turns out, they're sugar cane. Um, and uh -huh. so... <laughs> Uh, yeah, you, you, you really get an, an education. But if you look in the painting itself, you look and see the, the gentleman on the boat, he doesn't, have, he doesn't have any fear in his face. He doesn't have any fear. Um, he's there and he's you know, riding out the waves. On the top right-hand corner, you see a water spout. On the top left-hand corner, you see a masted ship. What that indicates is that like the fishermen in the previous painting, that help isn't going to come very soon. And so when this painting was exhibited, um, you know, early on, uh, we, <laughs> there was a group of older ladies that were very distressed by this image. And, um, and, a, and one of the ladies, and it was exhibited in New York, one of the ladies requested an, a, a, an explanation for the narrative of the painting because I, I imagine, like myself, they were really frightened by this image. And so Homer said, I regret very much that I have painted a picture that requires any description at, at all. I have crossed the Gulf Stream 10 times and I should know something about it. The boat and the sharks are outside matters of very little consequences. They have been blown out to sea by the hurricane. You can tell these ladies that the unfortunate Negro who is now so, so dazed and parboiled will be rescued and return to his friends and home <laughs> and live a happily ever la after life. So, you know, he really, he really, he really was very defensive about his imagery, but you know, it, it is a very, very powerful imagery um, itself, particularly being done in the 19th century. Okay, so the, the last couple of slides here really deal with his time in Maine and, and his subject matter in Maine. And when he was in Maine particularly, his focus was the sea. And what I always like to think of is that his mistress 
be and the various moods of the sea itself from the very beautiful days to the very storm worthy days and because it was ever changing and he didn't you know there was never two days where the, the sea was going to be alike and so it became his quest particularly in the last 15 or so years of his life in Maine um, to try and capture the essence of the sea uh, along the Maine coast and two of his probably his most brilliant paintings of of the, uh, the sea itself, it's Prowse Point, which are both, if you ever get to uh, the Clark in, in, in Williamstown, they're both side by side in Williamstown. The bottom one is, the, uh, no, excuse me, the top is called Eastern Point, the bottom is called Western Point. Um, so Eastern Point, uh, the top one was completed in just one month and it recorded, it recorded this very turbulent weather conditions. Um, the surface pounding along, uh, you know, uh, pounding along the rocks, the blues and the greens are very lifelike. Um, there's a gray sky, stormy sky. The, the, the rocks jut out into the sea, so the rocks are very stable. You have these lovely oranges and browns and yellows um, that, dis, uh, that really are totally descriptive of the sea. Um, the, 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 um, when it, the painting was exhibited in New York, uh, a New York critic hailed the painting saying, this was quite the next thing to a brisk tramp along the shore on a stormy day. And on the bottom, the bottom painting is West Point. Um, and he, he, he made note of this, that he painted this painting 15 minutes after sunset and not one minute before. And when he wrote about this, and he considered these two paintings, particularly the lower best paintings because he said to record such a fleeting moment took many days of careful observation from a specific point along the coast near his studio. And so he was able to capture these incidents, incidences in sketches and in drawings and then later translate them into his studio. And so with this, um, you know, uh, it's just a, a little final, final drawing, uh, final uh, photographs here of Winslow Homer in 1908. Um, he became very much a, a, a respected, refined uh, gentleman, um, living his life in Prout's Neck, um, occasionally coming to Boston, occasionally coming to New York, but always around the sea and always to the sea. And that was, you know, probably his most challenge because he could never conquer it, and, and nor, the, nor he should. The studio has been um, renovated. I think, I don't know if it is currently open to view, but this, you can visit. Uh, and you can walk along the same coast, coastal areas that Homer walked uh, along for the last 15 years of his life. So there we have it. Um, oh, so very I'm good. Going, yeah, I'm going to turn off, if I can figure this out, turn off the screen sharing. Um, if you have questions. Uh, okay, yeah. <clears throat> yeah. If anybody has any questions, Ruth, you want to monitor? Hi. Thank you, first of all, Laura, so much. Yeah, that Thank was very all. interesting. Just wonderful. And uh, I have a question, Laura. Yes, sir. Um, <clears throat> why did they pick the Scottish tartans to wear in that club if they weren't Scottish? I don't get that. Um, and many of them what had ancestors, that? and, and um, you know, they were very wealthy gentlemen. They had some ancestors uh, that were Scottish. Um, but I think it was, you know, if you think about okay. in the St. Patrick's Day parade and when the Pipers pipe along right. the, the pipes, you know, they wear, it was like a uniform. And then, and then the, the, um, well, they um, were fighters too, the Scottish. The, so. Yeah. And, the, and, and these, these men didn't start out as military. They, they became military during the war. And so, right. uh, you know, so it was, it was like a, a form of recognition for them. Okay. Thank you. You're welcome. Uh, Laura, the Houghton farm. Yep. Is that, how close is that to where Storm King Arts Center is? Very close because um, um, in, in 19, oh, this is the interesting aspect about that. Uh, in 1963, uh, Mr. Ogden had an exhibition of the paintings of Houghton Farm. The paintings were lent by the, the granddaughters of, of Lawson Valentine. Um, and it, I don't know that exactly borders on the Storm King property itself, but it borders Black Rock Forest, uh -huh. and it goes right up into Scunamunk, onto the Scunamunk yeah, Bridge I there. I see it, yes, definitely. Yep. Yeah. Yep. Uh, and I liked the, the, the painting, one of the paintings with the two children and the stone wall. Yes, 
Yeah. <laughs> just like the Stone Wall and Storm King Art Center. Yes. Yeah. 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 And then, and, you know, the, uh, I guess, I mean, I don't, but I guess hikers in this area, you know, as you walk throughout the countryside, you see these remnants of old farms, you know, that were really created right. during the night, you know, during the time that Homer was there. So, yeah, and I think that that's what he wanted to hearken back to, uh, a time, a time before the 1870s, you know, and hearken back to the, to the era, you know, like when the, 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 the countryside was really raw, and yet there was a romance to it, you know, looking back. Right. Anybody else? So now, did he ever get married? Nope. Never no. Did. Huh. I think after right. after um, the romance. He, after the romance. I mean, he did he did like women, but I don't know that he would have ever. I mean, you know, not a lot is said about that. But right. um, apparently, he 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 uh, in the early days, you know, he did would follow the women. Like that's why he came up to Milton and Hurley and all those places because right. his friends you know, were there and they, you know, they had the same, you know, same kind of friendships there. So, but he, no, he never right. did marry. Hmm. And that's why, that's why I think that the sea became his mistress, you know, right, and, right. and all that type of thing. Yeah. Uh, Laura, I'm looking now at the chat and there are, I guess, some other questions or comments on the chat. I don't know. You can. Okay. Not... Let me see if I can do that. Okay. Carol DeBeer, somebody isn't muted. It's a person on okay. how much time? Okay, how much time was required for him to make a drawing of life in the camp? And if you're referring to the camp in the um, in the in the the war during during the war during the South, he did sketches all the time, um, and he was he would make all of these rough drawings, rough sketches that you know, I guess in the evenings or whatever, he put together a, a, a series of drawings or series of sketches into a final drawing and those final drawings would then be brought back to Harper's which then the lithographer would then translate into a print so it could be printed in in the Harper's Weekly itself. Okay. Laura, the, yeah the um, original lithographs that you showed when he was working for Harper's um, for example the one that I'm thinking of, uh, the one um, where they had the, from the West Point dance. Yeah. Now, are those images that he would just um, come up with in his imagination or? Uh, well, I would imagine. Based on photographs, I guess. Yeah, I would imagine that Harper's would say, you know, maybe, I mean, you know, because this was 1858, maybe Harper's would say, you know, we'd like to have maybe an indication of what's going on at West Point, or maybe give him a, a gem of an idea. And so that, that image, say the, the, the drawing of West Point, wouldn't have, wouldn't have necessarily been his only drawing. It would have, it, he probably would have made a series of drawings and then compiled them to make a drawing that worked. Okay. So it would show the action. I mean, that one was fantastic because it wasn't so much concerned about the, the, the finery of the dress, it was all about the movement, you know, and that was really, I mean, that was really a, a lovely drawing, you know, about the movement, the sway of the dancers themselves. Are we doing any more questions or I think we're done, right? No, that was great. It was really wonderful. Thank All you, right. Laura. Thank oh, you're you. very welcome. So you're very welcome. It's been and my thank pleasure. Thank you, everybody, for joining us. And uh, yeah. We'll be doing it again in January and February. <laughs> All right, we'll look forward to it. Wait, wait, wait. Don't go away, everybody. I'm One other thing. In. One other thing. In uh, February, um, we're also going to be having a talk on Harriet Tubman um, by Leon DiMartino. He was going to do that uh, at the Desmond Center, and we contacted him, and so he's going to do it for the Friends of the Moffat Library. So, um, you know, keep looking at the calendar uh, for the date on that, the Moffitt Library calendar. Yeah. I just want to say thank you to two people, to Ruth Mannion, who's really been working very, <laughs> thank you, Ruth, for getting all this organized for us, with that, and to Joanne uh, DeLuca for working with us on that, too. Thank you, Joanne, for setting us up and being with us today. Laura, thank you. Everybody, I hope You're you have welcome. a wonderful holiday and a Merry Christmas, and thank we'll you. see you thank in you. January. Thank you. Okay, I thanks, hope Marianne. to see a lot of my friends there. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> Bye, everybody. Happy holidays. Happy holidays. Yes, you too. Bye, everybody. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.